recognize that and, and you know you're going to want to start working right away obviously but there's a certain amount of time you need to give yourself some grace and some time to take a breath and realize what you went through and truly congratulate yourself for that being in that place i learned so many things going forward it gave me a platform so that i could take that with me for further um, you know learning and growing so you know even if it's old technology it's still valuable you're earning an income and it is your practice within that dental setting so go for it find a company that's willing to rent equipment to you or purchase lease or do something and make your own arrangements and you're the provider it is your responsibility to provide high quality care get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast these are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast Gygenist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. So, Andrew, I'm so excited that we are finally putting this together. We've been talking about engaging with the students for a very long time now. Yeah, it's been a long time, and it's about time that we started really giving them the focus that they deserve, right? They're the future of our profession. They really are. And we're excited that PDT has sponsored this episode because they do believe in the students being the future of our profession. They're going to be our colleagues, right? Mm -hmm. You've heard about it in the past. We've been talking about PDT for a long time. They believe very much in quality education, and they've been sponsoring our episodes for a long time now. Yes. And we think all of these episodes are actually going to be really great, even for the veteran hygienist. We really wanted to make these episodes and these roundtables focusing on topics that students are going to either be presented with when they go into new offices, maybe things that are happening during their time as a student. But, you know, how do they go and move from student to new grad to experienced RDH? Yeah, so we're expecting to have episodes. Sometimes it'll be on instrumentation. Uh, how to adapt to certain angles, using an ultrasonic, maybe sharpening the instruments. Uh, and then other times we're going to talk about what types of offices that you're going to encounter, whether it's corporate, private practice, maybe a DSO. We'll talk about pay structures. There's just so much that's out there that that you're right. Even the the veteran hygienist is going to need to know these things as well. And so we hope you enjoy this episode and be sure to check out PDT your Paradise Dental Technologies, because they have some of the greatest instruments. Hey, Michelle. Yeah? It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. All right, everyone, welcome to student roundtable number two, entitled Confidence versus Humility. We have an amazing panel for you today, and we'll go around and do introductions, starting with Marianne, then Joanne, and then Eva. All righty. Well, it's so fabulous to be here and part of this faculty roundtable and sharing with the students some ideas as they get near graduation. I am currently on faculty at Cape Cod Community College, south of Boston, and I've also taught at a school, Collin College, which is north of Dallas, currently speaking, but will always keep a foot in the education arena because I think there's a lot of value with that. And I just love teaching and I'm so happy to be part of this today. Thank you. So, hey everybody, I'm Joanne Gorenlian. I am a graduate faculty member at Idaho State University, and there's nothing like being on a podcast with Michelle and Andrew. <laughs> and I love working with students. I've been in dental hygiene for a little over 40 years. I can't believe I'm saying that, but I guess it's a great thing when you love what you do. Amen to that. I am Eva Ramsey. I have been a dental hygienist for almost 15 years now, which is just crazy to think about. I've spent most of my career in Perio, and I've spent the last five years as full-time faculty at an entry-level baccalaureate program. Well, welcome, everyone. Yeah, I mean, and students, I mean, you're not going to get probably a more diverse background group who has lots of expertise in this. We're really excited to bring this to you. And so we're going to go ahead and get started with our question number one. So can we start with your thoughts on where these students are right now? So they've been studying nonstop since they entered the program. 
and likely they're feeling probably less than confident in themselves. So what can they do right now to build confidence? I'm going to jump in with breathe. <laughs> this is a very <laughs> this is a very good time of the year to breathe and take a deep breath and know that you haven't gotten this far along, especially senior students with you can see graduation coming down the pike and you know, take some assurance that you're where you are because you've made it this far and that your faculty are watching you and big picture, you are where you're supposed to be and you're going to be confident and have a lot more growth. So there's something to be said to relax a little bit and, and know that you're where you're supposed to be. Also developing good self-assessment skills. You know, it's really, really super important to understand where you're at, your strengths and your weaknesses and where you can improve and also set goals to grow. So if you can identify some of your weaknesses, make sure that you set some good like identifiable goals to be where you want to be. So I am going back in time for just a minute and trying to remember what it was like to be a dental hygiene student. And, you know, I'm thinking, well, we're in February and somewhere not too far away, you're about to take your national board examinations. And I can remember preparing for them and thinking to myself, you know, my teachers were giving me their very best and helping me be ready to pass a pretty big exam. And if I'm not ready for that, then what am I ready for? So they've helped me get this far and they're not working to make me be unsuccessful they're working to make me be successful so try to remember that everything that we're doing as educators is preparing you to be the best that you can be and keep that in the back of your mind as well that you're striving for success and you're striving to be excellent in what you do. So just make sure you focus on that as well, that you're going for um, opportunities to demonstrate how good you are, and that should help you build confidence. I was just going to add really quick to that, the fact that I think so many times it's easy as a student for students to kind of equate where they are with their grades. And Oftentimes, I mean, as much as we would like those two things to correlate, they, they don't always. So even if they find themselves getting a lot of bad grades, especially in senior clinic their last semester, I think sometimes that can take a toll on their confidence, when in reality, they should be using that to encourage them in being able to identify areas that they can improve. I want to add just one other thing on that, too, that this is such a great world of apps. And, you know, as we're going through these past or the next few months before taking the boards, et cetera, it's a time to really get with your schoolmates and get with your, your friends and your peers and do some studying and, and get ready together. Because when you study in a group like that, you can head check with them and you'll know, you'll feel, you'll end up feeling like you know more than you think you do. And when you stay in your own world and kind of in your own head, it gets scary and overwhelming. So if you can get with your buddies, get with your, um, you know, school peers and, and go over some review type things, I think you'll get a sense of, I know more than I think I do. And that's a good feeling. And then head check it with some of these apps. There's a lot of board review apps and, you know, you want to be careful not popping around those too much, but I think it's important to stop for a minute and, and take some quizzes or reviews and, and understand, you know, more than you think you do. The other thing I think that's helpful is if you look at your patients and you start to see them getting better, well, they didn't get better overnight and they didn't get better because you wished them to get better. They got better because you were their health care provider and you were providing good care under the guidance of faculty, but also largely because of you. And that's a measure of success as well. And that should help you build confidence too. So, you know, you start out as you know, a young freshman or junior, you don't know how to use your instruments and you're really confused and unsure of what you're doing. And now you're a senior in the last semester 
and you do know those instruments and you know how to use them and you see a patient and they start out not looking very well in terms of oral health and you are the one who changes their oral health behavior and you are the one who helps them improve their oral health and that should be a measure of success and build confidence as well. Not to disagree with you, Joanne, but like I gave all my patients crystals and then I didn't actually work on them. And then they got healthy from the crystals. Oh my oh, gosh. Sure, yeah. sure. That's Did you also have them school. do coconut oil? <laughs> Just yeah. do a little oil pulling. It was fine. Sure. Sure, Andrew. Okay. We believe you. <laughs> oh, so how do they take that and find the confidence or keep the confidence after they graduate and get their license and start treating patients in, in the real world. One thing I want to say is when they, once they get out, they get their board results, which you will, all of you will, you need to understand you have a little bit of PTSD. Is that how you say it? <laughs> yeah. PTSD, post-traumatic <laughs> stress <laughs> disorder. <laughs> and, and recognize that. And, and, you know, you're going to want to start working right away, obviously, but there's a certain amount of time you need to give yourself some grace and some time to take a breath and realize what you went through and truly congratulate yourself for that and take a breath before you just jump in because that will help with confidence uh, as well. But if you pass those boards and got through school, believe me, you all have the confidence, should have the confidence to do just fine out there and everybody starts somewhere. Remember that. Yeah, I I think you should you should remind yourself that you start by taking small steps, not big giant leaps with anything that you do. You take a small step and small steps lead to bigger steps. So write down three things you want to accomplish in the first few months. Not you want to change the world, but you want to accomplish these three things. And then you can start building goals from there. Um, be realistic about what you can do. And you might be, surprise yourself. And that's how you build confidence. You accomplish those small goals, which lead to bigger goals. And one of the things that I think is really great is when you track your success when you're able to look back and say, wow, these are the things that I did. And you can do that for yourself, but you can also do that for your patients. And I think it's really important when you're in practice to monitor and evaluate your progress in a practice, the contributions that you're making in a practice so that your employer is made aware of those things as well. That's how you are able to negotiate salary changes and, and benefits and things like that. Um, you have to be able to track success. So you should do that for yourself. You should do that for your patients and you should do that for the practice. Would you say that that counts as like, because I think my first set of goals coming out of hygiene school were like, get social life, pay bills. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know if they were necessarily like, watch patients. So is that kind of where your your thought is, is like, start looking at yourself as a clinician? Yes, exactly. I do think that I think that it's great to have. Yes, I think there's some big goals that you have, you know, get a job, earn money, pay my student loans, um, get a car, you have a life for heaven's sake, mm -hmm. you haven't had one for two years. Um, those are those kinds of goals. But then in clinical practice, I think you should also have some goals, have my patients be successful, have them improve their oral health care in some way, um, whatever, however you're defining those kinds of things, but have them be measurable so that you can then say, this is what I have done for the practice. How have you built the practice? You know, so that you are a valuable person in the seen as a valuable person in the practice. You know, you don't want to be seen as someone who is necessarily demanding, but you want to see as someone who is contributing. So how are you contributing to the practice? So I would also like to add that I feel like a lot of times students need perspective. And I'm the junior class coordinator at my particular school. So, you know, I'm, I'm with the babies. And I have to remind them often that, you know, it takes a really long time to be an excellent hygienist. It takes a, it takes a lot longer than what school affords you to be very effective at instrumentation. 
So I think that them knowing that helps them to realize that, you know, they're not terrible. Absolutely. Good point. Yes, that is an excellent point. And I think some of the patients that I saw as a student were the hardest patients that I've still yet to see as of practicing hygiene. Well, I, I think back to the patients that I had the first year that I had graduated and I cringe just thinking about it because I've learned so much since then. And also, you know, to add to that point, experience doesn't mean excellent. It doesn't mean better. It's what you do with that time. Great point. So I guess, it, you know, I want people to be confident, especially coming out of school. I want them just to really just project that. But the problem is that sometimes it comes off as maybe arrogance. And so where is that line between the, this confidence and then the humility? Well, I, I think one thing that I like to try to remind the students going through the program is to really remember gratitude and whether it's gratitude for your faculty taking extra time with you, gratitude for when you get out there and there's a coworker willing to stay late to kind of show you the ropes or your dentist for that matter. Saying thank you goes such a long, long way and you're going to be insecure and confidence is going to be an issue. But if you show people that you are so grateful for their time and your head's in the game, that that's really going to help because personally, there's nothing worse as a faculty that if you spend time with a student, which we love to do and we will stay late, but if they don't give you that kind of eye contact of thank you. I, I think that's a piece of advice that goes a long way to developing um, better relationships. Yeah, I think the answer to this question always comes down to attitude and communication skills. So, you know, for example, if a student comes and maybe their dentist wants them to do something that they don't understand, they could be like, well, I never had to do that in school or I don't I don't know why you want me to do this versus, you know, phrasing it in a different way. Um, it, it just makes all the difference in the world. Good point. And I think being honest is really a good, good thing to do. Um, I don't know how to do that. I haven't learned that yet but I'm willing to learn that is very different than being arrogant about something. I'm not going to do that because I'm the hygienist is very different than I don't know how to do something, but I'm willing to learn. And thank you for helping me learn that. You know, all of those things are very different. So attitude and communication are, are key factors. So dropping the ego necessarily and being willing to communicate that you don't know it all, but you're going to really try hard. I like that. So how does that translate into the interview process? Well, I, I mean, I think they have to, again, respect the fact that they're coming into a profession brand new. And, you know, you have to go in with good questions and have your three focused questions, I guess, but, but do maybe more listening initially as far as what the dentist is looking for, what the practice is looking for. And... I think the dentists know you're new. <laughs> they know you're brand new and it's not a secret when you graduated. So, you know, own that and, and be humble enough to say, this is will what I'm willing to try. But again, I think it comes down to, uh, I'm going to use the word hierarchy. There's a certain hierarchy in dentistry and you have to respect that these dentists are, are hiring and, and willing to take time to interview you. I think you need to also respect that time and, I think, uh, you know, Joanne said it, that just tell them what you hope to offer for the practice. Yeah. So just to add to that, I think a, a, this has been a lot easier for me to realize since becoming faculty, because I think a lot of times students don't realize the small things when it comes to interviews. So just, you know, dressing professionally, showing up on time, being courteous, bringing a copy of your resume, your portfolio, just those little things make a big difference in the, the end result. And also going in and discussing your goals, what you hope to accomplish. Great advice. And turn your phone off. <laughs> turn, <laughs> turn your, your ringer off. off. And you go in. <laughs> yeah. So how does confidence and humility play a role in the salary negotiations for these new grads? Um, well, I, I think that, you know, a working interview is al always a really good idea. And if you feel like they're kind of coming in low with a salary offer or, you know, know your terrain, kind of know the area, what the going rate is uh, going into it. But, you know, offer to do a working interview at this salary and, and maybe if you accept it to ask for a review in X amount of time to see if, you know, that can increase a little bit. I think you need to be 
flexible and be open to uh, maybe starting at a certain level if, if all the other right pieces are there. I have to agree with Marianne on this one because I think that sometimes you think, well, gee, everybody else is getting X amount. Why shouldn't I get that too? Well, <laughs> the fact is you have no experience. So you may not want to be the one who thinks that you deserve something that you haven't earned. So that's why I think it's so important to be willing to set goals and track your performance. You know, you are improving the health of your patients. How do you know that? How do you know that? So if you are documenting that you have seen X number of patients over a given period of time and their health has improved, that is a measure. That is a performance measure. And a lot of people forget to do that. They say, well, I seen, I have seen this number of patients and it equates to a monetary value in the practice. And that is one measure of success for sure. But another measure of success is the, this number of patients and their health has improved. And I think that is something to look at as well. So you want to think about other elements to take that you want to take into consideration when you're looking at what are my performance measures. So we understand being a practicing hygienist, like that interaction with the dentist is, it's very important, but it might be kind of difficult if you have not ever experienced that. So what are some, what should, be they, what should they be practicing as students in this moment to kind of uh, start to develop that interaction and that handoff? So at, at my particular school, um, we actually kind of practice this in some way. So we expect for the radiographs to be pulled up, ready to be viewed. If it's a new patient, you should introduce your doctor to the patient. You should also remind them of old treatment that is existing for the patient and then any findings that you found at that particular appointment. I think I also value when a hygienist speaks in professional terminology. Absolutely. And speaks scientifically versus um, colloquial. So make sure that you are professional at all times. And, and this, this dentist that you're working with is a doctor and deserves to be treated with respect. This person is not your friend and is, is not a father figure or mother figure and should be treated with the highest possible regard. I wanted to just add something to that too. You know, unless you go to a dental hygiene school that has a dental school attached to it, sometimes you're not real familiar with what they are doing from an operative standpoint. And I think there's a lot of value with saying, hey, can I can I come in and watch one of your operative procedures? Can I watch what you're doing and show interest in their their clinical skills? And sometimes that will flip the other way as well. But I just think developing respect and developing respect for what they do clinically and also respect the fact that, you know, they've got a lot of overhead that you may not be aware of. And, you know, I think I think sometimes that's not understood unless you marry one of them, which I did. <laughs> and, and then you get a whole new perspective. And, you know, you really want to look at the whole health of the practice, not just what you're getting and what you're taking home, but but Yes, Joanne said what you're contributing to the practice, but also the stresses that everybody else, including the dentist, is up against. Can Can I ask kind of a, a follow up question with that? It's not necessarily going to be for the students, but it's going to be for maybe some of the, the established hygienists out there, or maybe it's something that for the students to squirrel away for when this happens. How does that dynamic change when you are not no longer looking at them as a mother or father figure, but now you are the mother or father figure to the dentist? Twenty years has come by and it's a new grad dentist coming in. Like, how does that dynamic change as far as your confidence and also the humility with which you treat that person? I, I'd like to just say that, I, I mean, I think everybody lacks confidence sometimes. And the newer you are, whether it's a dentist or a hygienist, you're just so open to an energy that somebody gives you that, you know what, let me, let me help you with this. And 
we're all in the same boat, even though, you know, we're all working in silos on some level in our own little world, in our own room. I think we need to be open to just being there while someone is learning and someone is newer. And even it's an interesting question. I think it's a challenge and I think it's an honor to help a new dentist, a younger dentist kind of walk through the the ropes of the real world. And it's scary. I mean, it's scary for hygienists going in brand new and very scary for doctors as well. So I think we need to work together as a profession, like really hygienists and doctor. And there's some, some tension over, over certain things in different states with, with dentists on hygienists. And I think we should work towards being there for each other. It might sound corny, but I believe that. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of times whenever treatment plan philosophies don't always match up between either their either the doctor and the hygienist or even like the student, you know, the new student. A lot of times that comes from just completely different mindsets on perio treatment. I know my idea of what periodontal disease has changed tremendously <laughs> since I first started hygiene. So I treat my plan a lot different now than I did whenever I was first out of school. And this goes for a new graduate dentist too. I mean, they are overloaded with things on their plate. So I think ultimately the the goal is it should be communication and you know finding a happy ground, a happy medium. That's great. All right. Everyone we've done so well so far. We're on Q7. Okay. How you guys doing? You guys doing okay? Yeah. I'm doing okay. great. Well, let's keep going. All right. So the students listening to this, um, sometimes they'll have three hours to do like half a mouth trophy. <laughs> uh, this isn't obviously going to be the thing that's going to be in the real world. So I want to talk about speed and developing speed without compromising quality. And how can they can start improving now while they're in school to develop that? I, I'm going to speak to that. Honestly, I, I think as a faculty or as a student's perspective, I don't think you're thinking anything in this last semester about what it's going to be like when I get out there. I think you're just doing your best to do what you can in the clinic and hope the faculty is not looking at you. <laughs> I mean, I think that you're, you're just doing your best to get through. And I think once you, you are at the point where you're getting out, it's important to think about sequencing and developing a good sequencing for instrumentation where you're going to start in a certain area and end in that area and keep that consistent and and think about the high level goals what do they look like from a perio perspective and you know get a good dental hygiene diagnosis and and you know keep looking at that as your foundation but i would say sequencing and you know just being very thorough on your assessments so my answer is actually going to go more toward the faculty and the program directors i th i just think that if we are expecting students to go into the workforce when they've had four hours for a profi, we are doing them a huge disservice. We should be making sure that they are going to be up to par as far as appointment, you know, expectations before they get to that point. I have to wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that the, the last semester should be all about preparing for practice settings. And I think students should be slowly integrated into being responsible for their own practice while they're in school so they could understand what it means to be safe and effective practitioners. And they should be making their own decisions and they should be supervised by faculty where they, where they understand what that means. And I, you know, would love to see it where they have hour schedules for patients and um, something that simulates real life and let them have that uh, responsibility. And program directors and faculty need to understand what letting go means, but um, in an environment where they have supervision and they have teaching and are given some flexibility and critical decision make, critical thinking and decision making. And I think that the whole process evaluations need to go in that semester and the the whole evaluation system needs to be altered so that students are really prepared for practice. I, everyone's program does that, right? Like, because I, I know my last semester with my students, they get an hour for what, like a certain type of patient, an hour and a half. Everyone's doing that? No? I would say no. I would say it varies. And I think the, they, I think they attempt to get them more accelerated I just think from a student's perspective, and I could be wrong, I, I don't think you're thinking about 
you should be. I, I don't think they're thinking about a pace in the office or how am I going to do this in an office. I think their mindset is I need to pass the boards. I need to pass both sets of boards and, you know, get my patient requirements done. And and that is a mentality that I would like to see change because it's not about the number of patients and, you know, the number of uh, full months I have to take. It comes down to quantifiable numbers for them versus, you know, looking at what the whole day is going to look like when they graduate. So, yeah, I mean, if they could have more real life examples and and I'll add to that more insurance knowledge. And I know every school is different, but but, you know, I think the, from my view, they don't get enough insurance information coming out of the gate. And that's it's OK to talk about insurance and have them have a working knowledge of what certain codes mean. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I actually go out of my way to teach them CDT codes. In fact, in, in our clinic, whenever they present their treatment plan, they have to also give us the code. So I think it's extremely important for students to understand how to use the CDT codes correctly because so many offices don't use them correctly. And if I'm an employer, then I think that's a huge advantage of a, of a student coming in. If they know how to code correctly, they can teach the office how to code correctly. I agree. That's a great point. I think I'm a mean adjunct faculty because if someone comes up to me and it's like, I need an hour and a half, I'm like, I'll see you an hour. <laughs> this, is a, this is a profi patient. I'll see you in one hour. <laughs> so when I started, I was in one of my offices and we had the, you know, the dip tanks, right? For the x-ray processing <laughs> that I know a lot of people aren't going to really understand what that is. The dark room. Um, and the, the yeah. dark room. And then there's the different types of dark rooms, right? There's the ones where you close the door behind you, but then there's the ones with the revolving door. I don't know if you right. saw those. <laughs> yes, okay. yes. So You're technology, <laughs> technology is all over the board and just different pockets of different, even the, in the same state are going to have different things. So how should they approach a situation when their office that they're going into is not up to date with technology. <laughs> so I guess I'll just chime in here. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm a millennial, barely, but, but I am a millennial. One of my very favorite jobs at a periodontist office was straight out of like the 1960s, 1970s. It was, it was very dated, but I will say that being in that place, I learned so many things going forward. It gave me a platform so that I could take that with me for further, um, you know, learning and growing. So, you know, even if it's old technology, it's still valuable. I think it what enters into that, too, is understanding the overhead and understanding you know, they, maybe that office just hasn't been able to to get the technology. And, and again, it depends on where you went to hygiene school and, you know, how gifted your clinic was as far as having certain equipment. And, you know, I, I do lectures on ultrasonic and I'll always say, you know, you're only as good as what's in your hands and you have to use the best equipment you can use. But on the same token, you've got to balance that with the reality of what the dentist can provide, what the office can provide. But I think as long as you're speaking about evidence-based practice and evidence-based decision-making and, and respectfully and slowly maybe show some new technology and why there is advantages to that and, you know, schedule maybe a lunchtime where you can have the doctor's ear a little bit to, to, to show some of the positives of having better upgraded equipment. But at the end of the day, it's their practice and, you know, this certain amount of you should feel good about being there, but uh, you also have a certain responsibility to let them know about updated technology. So just to add on that really quickly, I actually try to reinforce to my students that it's actually their personal professional responsibility to provide good high quality care. So if your dentist isn't willing to pay for that care, then I absolutely think that you should because ultimately it's gonna fall into your lap. So, I mean, I have purchased piezos, saddle stools, loops, instruments, and I, I just think that that should just be normal practice. I'm going to jump in now on that train because I think sometimes we have this expectation that we're in someone else's office and they should give us everything we ever hope and dream to have. And there's nothing wrong with you getting your own equipment. It's you're the dental hygienist and it's your license and you are the one who is providing care for your patients. So maybe the office is a little bit antiquated and maybe they don't have everything that 
um, is the latest and greatest thing that you learned because you're graduating in 2019. That's okay. Um, maybe there are circumstances that are there that um, that office just doesn't have the ability to provide those things right now, but you do. You're earning an income and it is your practice within that dental setting. So go for it. Find a company that's willing to rent equipment to you or purchase lease or do something and make your own arrangements. And you're the provider. It is your responsibility to provide high quality care, as Eva has said. So do that. Um, make sure your instruments are good instruments. Make sure you can can offer the best that you can, either within those confines or beyond those confines by making your own arrangements to have the equipment that you need. Get a grant. Be creative. Uh, you certainly were creative enough in dental hygiene school, so be creative in your own practice. Yeah, I, I uh, will never forget. I, you know, like I said before, I teach the junior students, and one of them actually asked me if they could get permission to buy a saddle seat once they're into private practice. And I just thought that that mindset was super interesting. You know, it's not. It's not like a father daughter relationship, or at least it shouldn't be. It should be you are a professional and you should take care of your own body. So I think that's super important for students to understand. That's an excellent point, too. So that might lead us into like, what are one or two things that students shouldn't be doing both now and in once they graduate? What shouldn't they be doing from a yeah, like uh, I guess that that kind of is a good point. Like you shouldn't be relying on your dentist or anyone else to give you CE, to give you equipment. Like what shouldn't you be doing now and once you graduate? Don't don't put yourself in a position where you think you can't do things to be the best healthcare provider that you can be, and don't put the burden of your profession on someone else's shoulders. Um, your dentist is your employer, but you own your license to practice. So you are responsible for upholding your standards of practice. You are responsible for upholding your code of ethics. You are responsible for for valuing your license and valuing the fact that you are a healthcare provider. So don't let anybody take any part of that away from you. And that to me is the most important thing. So when someone says you can't do something, you shouldn't do something or try to devalue who you are and what you do, make sure you understand what it means to be a dental hygienist in all elements before you agree to any of those terms. So <laughs> I'm so glad that she just said this because it's such a great, a great point. But um, I actually go so far as to tell my new graduates to print off their state practice act, the ADHA standards of care, and have that available to them every single workday. Because if they're ever involved in an ethical situation they don't know the answer to, all they have to do is go look at that sheet and it should give them a good guideline. That's good. I should probably do that now, even as a practicing hygienist. I think we need to remember too, as faculty and as practicing clinicians, that the job market can be tough. And as much as we want our bar to be as high as it can be and should only seek those positions that, that are on that level without a doubt, you also have to balance that with what the job market is in your current location. And that varies very much around the country. And, you know, there's a lot of young clinicians going to work for the group practices and the DSOs. And, um, you know, that's that's the trend. And that can be a very good place, too. It's a good place to enter. You have a little bit of peer review or other um, clinicians and hygienists in a bigger group setting. But, you know, you have to have your checklist of what's important to you, what are must haves and, you know, keep that in mind. And there will be another interview, but also balance that with the reality of the job market. I think that's important to look at. I think that's a, yeah, that's a good point. You should every student should have their their bottom line. I think that's excellent. 
And with that, is there any final comments, especially when we look at the confidence versus humility as as students currently and then new grad or yeah, new grads? I'm going to say be, become a lifelong learner. And I don't mean that lightly. I really don't. That be, to become an outstanding clinician, you have to develop clinical expertise. And that to Eva's point, it doesn't just come with experience. You have to actively pursue courses, hands-on courses, and remember that the skill is just developing. You're just competent, but really to develop excellence, you have to get in the game, go to the courses, and become part of the association. I mean, so much has happened in dental hygiene to allow us to bring things forward, but there's a small percentage that that do it. And I just, I can't say it enough that there's much more to it than, I hate to hear that it's a magazine. There's so much more to it that the association does. And we need a, a force of people and we need some young minds out there to, to keep the movement going. Yeah, so, I mean, my, my t- top tips are to be a lifelong learner for sure. Um, And then also to be an advocate for our profession. And I don't mean that in the traditional sense of, you know, ADHA, of course, that's important. But I mean, one on one every day in the trenches. So what that looks like to me is, you know, when you have a patient that calls you the dental nurse or the dental technician, take two seconds to explain to them the difference and explain to them the education, display your degrees in your operatory. I think those types of things are very important. And I think the other thing is that you should be very proud of what you have accomplished because we all know how difficult it is to be in a dental hygiene program and to learn the science of dental hygiene and be proud to demonstrate your knowledge to your patients and to your colleagues and to others in healthcare. Don't diminish what you have learned, demonstrate what you have learned and be proud to be a public servant. You had a calling to this profession for a reason. So give your service to the public, be a part of the community, um, serve the community and let everyone know that this is what you do because it is your calling and because you're part of a noble profession, you're in healthcare. Enjoy it. I love it. I love all those words of advice. You guys are so amazing. I just, if I can just piggyback real quick on the things that you guys have been mentioning, because in my state in Washington, many of you probably know that there was a bill that was put forth through legislature that was basically allowing dental assistants to perioprobe, use the ultrasonic to debride, and also supragingival scaling, among other things, and with a quote, one-time course that they were going to try and teach it you need to be involved students you need to be involved new grads you need to be involved in whatever capacity that looks like Eva you really nailed it I think with my sentiments also I'm a member of ADHA the WDHA did a great job of advocating and pushing and fighting this bill and they've been doing all these things but it really took people that were not just members but people that were influencers to really rally the call. And it takes everyone in, and whether you like the, the, organiz, the professional organizations or not, you still need to work with them and work within the confines of whatever that looks like. Advocating with your patients so that they're involved. What if you do have a, a lawmaker in your seat and you get that one-on-one time to educate them? So please just don't forget to be involved in whatever capacity you have and we just want to thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for doing this roundtable. Um, we hope that we can do something like this again. You gave great answers. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was wonderful. You guys were all my faculty. <laughs> I'm sure you're fabulous faculty, Michelle. Wow, well, I want I want y'all to teach me all the time. <laughs> but thank you so much. And any contact information if someone has questions. Sure. Um, You can reach me at my email address for Idaho State University at G-U-R-E-J-O-A-N at I-S-U dot E-D-U. Or you can call me at 208-240-1443. Awesome. I love it. We love when people get phone numbers. Yeah. (laughs) 
And my email address at the college is uh, mdreyer at capecod.edu. I can be reached at ramseyev at hawassi.edu. And my telephone number is 865-214-2211. Wow. Y'all are great. Y'all are amazing. Thank you guys so, so very much. And yes, thank, you. thank you again for coming on the podcast. Thank you both for doing this. It really brings brings a lot to this generation and to new graduates. Thank you. We hope you really enjoyed that round table and be sure to check out PDT Dental. Head over to their website, Paradise Dental Technologies. And check, if you're on the show floor go to, going to trade shows, go see them. Check them out. They're great, great people. And a special thank you to the guests that were on this episode. Feel free to reach out to them as well. They have a lot of good information for you and they like to be contacted. So you'll see their information in the show notes. And be sure to follow us on Instagram or Facebook. You're welcome to send us messages through either of those social media platforms. And you can send us a message at a tale of two hygienist at gmail.com. You can even email us directly, either Michelle at a tale of two hygienist.com or Andrew at a tale of two hygienist.com and head over to our website and subscribe to our newsletter a tale of two hygienist.com. There's a theme going on there if you haven't been able to tell. <laughs> and also, we're always looking for ideas for student roundtables. So if you're a student and you have a specific topic you want us to tackle, please reach out to us. Let us know. We appreciate you for listening and we hope you have a great week. Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all.